Hi everyone, I'm Jen White and I'm an immigration attorney and also an adjunct professor with VISTA. So I want to talk to you about thinking like an advocate. So when you are an advocate, when you're representing your client, you are trying to convince your adjudicator that they're eligible for relief. You're taking on a completely different role than you do in most aspects of your life. So you're going to be trying to convince, you're going to try to make your case. So I think it's really important to think about, you know, your own personality, your own disposition, your own strengths and weaknesses, so that you can try to be prepared for this role. So sometimes this is going to go really smooth for you. You're going to walk into court, walk into an agency, you're going to be able to read the room, you're going to have a strong case, you're going to know how to argue it, things are going to go smoothly. Other times you're going to run into conflict. So we all know at this point that the immigration laws are tough. They create narrow pathways for people to get relief. So of course you're going to run into barriers. You're going to run into some difficult officers, some difficult judges. So how are you going to handle that? Psychology tells us that, generally speaking, we tend to handle conflict in one of three ways. We tend to fight back, we tend to flee, just get out of there, or we freeze up. So fight, flight, or freeze. So I think you should think about which of those three are you more prone to, and do you think that that will come up in your, in your practice? How will you deal with that? You know, how will you use your strengths to be assertive, but at the same time to be respectful, to diffuse a situation? So I'm going to tell you a story that it's a true story. It happened to me. And I want you to put yourself in my shoes so you can think about what you would do if you were me. So a couple years back, I was working at a law firm and I was handling a challenging case. So my client was convicted of some tough criminal history that basically barred him from relief. So I was coming up on a hearing for him and I had absolutely no idea what kind of argument I was going to make. No idea. But a couple of days before his hearing, the Supreme Court issued a decision called Prayer of East Sessions. So I'll let you look up the case. It's really fascinating. Um, but long story short, that case called into question the legitimacy of many notices to appear that have been filed over the course of the last couple of decades. So you might know that the notice to appear, when the government files that with the immigration court, that's what best jurisdiction with the immigration court over the immigrant. So that notice to appear is really important. So I won't get into the nitty gritty of the legal argument, but basically that Supreme Court decision made me think, oh, I can file a motion to terminate my client's proceedings because I have this amazing argument available to me. I'm going to argue that his notice to appear wasn't proper, it was invalid, so the court doesn't have jurisdiction over him. So at this time, this was in 2018, attorneys around the country were filing these motions. I was one of them. I knew it was a bold argument. All of us knew it was a bold argument. But that doesn't mean it's not worth trying. So I called the client, ran it by the client, walked into court, knew I was going to make this argument, file this motion to terminate. It was the only option we had. But let me give you a little bit of background about this judge that I was appearing in front of, because it's really important to know your judge. You want to read the room. You want to try to understand what you think will work with the judge. So this judge, his background was actually similar to mine. He was a respondent's attorney, an immigrant attorney, or I'm sorry, an attorney for immigrants. And he was really, really smart. Like when he would issue decisions, he had memorized a lot of the case law and could just, during his oral decision, just quote from his memory, remarkable um, citations from case law. He had a pretty high grant rate for immigrants, so that was all positive. And he had been a judge for many years, so he really knew what he was doing. Um, but on the flip side, he had a pretty ornery disposition, in my opinion. He, um, I just, to be honest, I always got the impression he didn't like me. He rolled his eyes at me a couple times, he yelled at me a couple times. He really pushed back when I would file submissions, and he really drilled me with some questions that sometimes were unanswerable. So, you know, kind of an interesting combination of challenge and um, some things that were beneficial to my client's case as well every time I went before him. But one thing I can say about him is that he granted everything I filed with him. 
whether that was a motion or whether those were applications. So I had already done two trials with this judge at that point, and he granted both of those applications for asylum. So I knew a little bit about, you know, his inclination to grant. But I also knew that I was likely to get yelled at that day when I walked in to file that motion to terminate. So I walk into court, I tell the judge, you know, I'm filing this motion to terminate based on Pereira v. Sessions. I gave a little synopsis of the argument, and the judge looked at me and he said, What? I'm not accepting this filing. If I was to grant this motion to terminate, then every single case in immigration court, which is nearly a million cases, should be terminated. That's absurd. I'm not accepting this motion. So I'm going to pause there and I want you to think about, number one, what would your response be? Do you think you'd be inclined to freeze up, to fight back, or to flee? You just want to get out of there? Or something else? Think about your immediate response. And second, what would you do? How would you respond to the judge? Um, and explain why. Why would your decision be the best decision for your client? So I hope this was helpful for you to think about, and I hope you'll push back and, you know, sometimes accept no for an answer when you absolutely have to, but most of the time I hope that you won't. Thanks.